morning you're listening to today on Radio 4 with John Humphreys in Dublin for the talks and me, Brian Redhead, in detention for being silly. <laughs> Between now and nine o'clock I shall be reading the news and I'll be colouring it in. <laughs> Meanwhile, here's the news for the hard of growing up. Watch out, watch out, John Humphreys about. <laughs> His call for a more environmentally aware NHS, Health Minister Kenneth Clark has put out an appeal for biodegradable patients. <laughs> Nursie and I think he's really after greener hospital staff, so they'll settle for even less pocket money. <laughs> if you really want to be kicked out of bed in the mornings, you need to tune to Radio 2. The only reason they use the medium wave is because most of their audience is dead. <laughs> they take some waking up. Morning, morning! Here we go, don't you know? Here we go with the Radio 2 stock market report. They've gone down! Coming up, though, full details of that devastating earthquake holocaust. Air. Word is, it's destroyed the entire South American continent. Still mustn't grumble. Here's the new one from Kiki D. <laughs> I hear a lot about uh, a lot about militants in the news lately. As you'll know, the government line is that all extremist groups uh, must be denied publicity, unless, of course, they can be blamed on Labour. In which case, it's quick, 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 get the cameras in, get the cameras, look at them, look what they're doing, Sam, Sam, look. Oh, no, the daft thing is, Kinnock's still getting the blame months after he expelled them. Oh, oh you're looking glum, Neil. What, 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 what? <laughs> I don't know, Roy. I just can't seem to get rid of all these militants. Uh, uh, what, you mean those sticky, stubborn ones that won't budge even after two flushes? <laughs> That's right. And, and I've tried ordinary disinfectants, but at today's lower temperatures, they just can't shift them. <laughs> They're further around the bend than we thought. <laughs> look, look, why don't I talk to them? Or, or spray them with something? <laughs> Same thing in your case, isn't it? <laughs> well, there's nothing to choose between extremists on the right or the left. I think young conservatives are just militants who shop at Next. <laughs> but what, I mean, who are these militants? Any unrest, you know, slightest disagreement, anything going wrong, there they are. It's like the little boy next door refuses to tidy up his bedroom. Mum says, you'll do as you're told. Next thing you know, ding dong, two men at the door. Get your socialist worker. It's like, can't go in there, sorry. Smash your Tories, flexible rostering. Mummy, mummy, mummy. Out, out, out. <laughs> Next thing you know, the riot started and we've got a United Nations peacekeeping force in the Arndale Centre. <laughs> what sort of campaign can you really hope to base on the slogan, Here we go, here we go, here we go. <laughs> the only place you hear that lately is in the deportation lounge at Heathrow. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, these days, Mr. Wu's got about as much chance of becoming a window cleaner as he has of becoming former Tory party chairman. <laughs> What's well, immigration debate? We're mucking about with people's lives here. With the latest rules of entry, they must feel like contestants on a game show. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, homemakers. This way to Britain, Bob's full house. Oh, oh, where, where are you from? Where, where are you from? Where are you from, darling? British Commonwealth Territory of Hong Kong? Mm, oh, you're wally, darling, and can't <laughs> My love's all right, nice to see you, to see you. Well, damn inconvenience at the moment, actually. I don't know, I, I really don't. You, you want to come in? You want to come into Britain? You want to bet on it? No, no, you can come here if you play your cards right. <laughs> so what do you think, a few thousand? Uh, higher, higher. Uh, 50,000, lower, lower. Norman's habits, can you get any lower? Uh, no, so 50,000 immigrants it is. So, oh, Oh, 50,000 pounds! Oh, 50, oh, that's right, my love. So, jolly good, jolly good. Uh, you've got a twin sister here, and you want to join her. I'm sorry, get nothing for a pair, not in this game. You sort of... Uh, you don't have a visa? Oh, never mind, we take access. Yes, indeed. Anyone can come and live in Britain if the price is all right. <laughs> Mind you, anyone trying to come here from our former colonies has already learnt what the game's all about. That's why they call it the Crapton Factor. <laughs> And so, to our final reconstruction tonight, which concerns a particularly violent case of mugging. Sue. Our reconstruction starts at about 7.59pm on the night of Monday, March the 5th. Margaret Whitaker was just settling down in front of her television when she noticed something suspicious on the screen. And now on ITV, never the twain. <laughs> Uh, morning, my old friend. Uh, something I was meaning to run. Uh, something you mean? Something you mean? But it was me, you mean? Uh, the thing of it is, I've been, um, well, 
Ragnar offered this um, exquisite little French piece with the most um, fantastic legs. Absolutely <laughs> gorgeous. Gorgeous drawers. <laughs> um, the thing is, do you, um, do you think I should um, go after it? Quite frankly, laddie, what to do with your own sex life is up to you. <laughs> Superintendent Nigel Bafter is in charge of this case. Superintendent, what can you tell us about it? Uh, well, sir, as Nick said, it was a particularly nasty and prolonged case of mugging, <laughs> uh, lasting some 30 minutes in total, and in which the assailants mugged their way through an entire episode and showed not the slightest mercy for their audience. <laughs> was that all right? <laughs> suspect that those same two men may be responsible for a number of other cases of mugging that you know about. Uh, yes, we have a number of leads that would seem to connect one of the gentlemen concerned to a number of unprovoked muggings in the show Two's Company, <laughs> an alleged comedy, <laughs> and while we believe the other gentleman may well have been involved in similar offences in the show It Ain't Off Like All Those Other Ones We've Written, Mum. <laughs> Both these men are extremely dangerous and should not be approached. Uh, certainly not. In fact, uh, one of them does have a criminal record. Yes. Let's just take a look at that. <laughs> Why do you wish for a tree grass? Why tell a tree what it's short? Whispering grass. Lovely day for a of gardening, eh? <laughs> And you do have a fairly accurate description of the men you'd like to interview about these offences. Uh, that's right. One of them is described as medium height, medium built, and a complete and utter ham who couldn't take the skin off a rice pudding. And the other one, quite frankly, darling, words fail me. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know how he gets the work. Did you see his leer at the Queen's? Yes, what did you think? Well, uh, to be honest, darling, I'd sooner not say. Oh, so, join us in a quarter past eleven. We're waiting for your calls Wait. on... Oh. Crime Bitch Update. <laughs> Nick Ross and Sue Cook are currently appearing in See How They Run at the Yvonne Arno Theatre in Guildford. <laughs> Inspector Nigel Bafter is a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company. <laughs> I'd like to give the Soviet people peace. I'd like to give the American people peace of mind. I'd like to give the British people peace of my mind. <laughs> the Nicaraguans have elected a woman who'll do anything I say. The Filipinos have elected a woman who'll do anything he says. I'm just a girl who can't say no. I believe that in the Soviet Union, I can keep some of the people happy some of the time. I believe that in America, I can keep some of the people happy all of the time. I believe that in Britain, I can keep all of the people happy all of the time. But why should I? <laughs> I intend to stop the spread of communism. I intend to stop the advance of socialism. What a lot we have in common. <laughs> In a democracy, local government represents the people. In a communist state, local government does what central party tells it to. We do have a lot in common. <laughs> power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. <laughs> Yes, all across Eastern Europe, the road to freedom is clear, and that's official. Good morning, comrade Bob Pickers. Here's the rush hour traffic report, and it's good news for drivers. With 50% of the country's cars off the road being serviced, and the other one parked in Tashkent, the road is clean and green all the way to the Poland bypass. And as they desperately struggle from the wreckage of their communist past, it's time to say, Dos Vidania to roads like this, and hello to the future. <laughs> Yes, when it comes to transport, Britain leads the way. The great thing is, we were the first country in the world to introduce a comprehensive policy of transportation. And well, you know, I think the Australians benefited a great deal. <laughs> These days, of course, we just bang them up in strange ways. 
And Britain remains at the cutting edge of transport technology with such great innovations as the advanced passenger train. Any more tea, coffee? Oh, here's another bend. Oh. Two lumps, please. Oh! <laughs> the electric car. <laughs> and the channel tunnel. <laughs> Yes, well, the main thing with transport is having a policy and maintaining it rigidly, firmly, steadily, no matter how hard or sticky or throbbing it might be. We've seen stockings and suspenders. And so, with our extensive road network and ever-increasing vehicle ownership, every car now has exactly 50 feet to move in. The M1 was built in 1959 to carry 14,000 vehicles every day. By 1989, it had beaten its target carrying 14,000 vehicles every hour. And it's not nearly enough. We want more cars on the roads, hence the government's two billion pound investment. In public transport? No, silly, in company car tax perks. That's four times the entire British Rail subsidy. But, Mr Parkinson, by the year 2025, there'll be so many cars, we'll need an M1 19 miles wide just to park them. Yes, and the exciting thing is, every year, cars produce four times their weight in carbon dioxide. That's a tremendous contribution to the greenhouse effect. Temperatures will rise with enormous savings in heating bills. Half the country will be underwater and will save billions in road building. Simple, aren't I? So saying, he unveiled the car of the future. All right, my fatty, and make a left of the next roundabout. And mind those king penguins. I'm feeling a bit sick, sir. Go oh, left now, sir. Here we go. Oh, there's an old roundabout. Says a ruddy great whale. <laughs> but in Britain, we know how to run a train set. Cutting services, stations, branch lines, and cutting subsidies by 25%. And, of course, building the Channel Tunnel. <laughs> in 1890, we had 17,000 miles of railway. In 1990, modernization and streamlining has given us this. <laughs> and that's still too much. British Road, regret to announce this is a blue saver day, which being a bank holiday makes it a white saver, but that's not valid today. You do better with a return, which is cheaper than a single, but more expensive in the long run on short journeys. Then again, it all depends on when you're coming back, because it's better off-peak midweek than mid-peak off-week, unless you're staying overnight. Then you want the away day bargain break, which is cheaper than a return, but not as cheap as a cheap day return, if you're only going one way. Or you can take a network card with three adults and up to four children off-peak, and at weekends, providing you go up on the down line, stay over and return before you left. <laughs> better still, there's a bus station next door. It's not just on the railways that the race is on to attract the all-important customer. While the rest of us get used to being second-class citizens. And do you know that a hundred years ago, the journey from Manchester to Derby in a filthy black train took an hour and a half? And how long does it take now? An hour and fifty minutes, <laughs> but in a filthy blue and yellow train. Yes, all across Eastern Europe, they're just itching to see the results of investment in our roads. Investment in modern railways. <laughs> and our channel tunnel. But it's to the man responsible that we leave the last word. Sorry. <laughs> you know, there's an old saying in show business that I just wrote. It says that some people are born great, some achieve greatness, and others have greatness thrust upon them in between movie commitments. <laughs> but you don't have to take my word for it. So, in a sense, we come to our last, and indeed our final film tonight, The Mortgage Corporation. <laughs> a much underrated offering this, at times touching, at times moving, and at times quite breathtaking, it's a compelling story of one man, played quite brilliantly, for my money at least, by Barry Norman. <laughs> In this beautifully crafted scene we're about to see from the movie, Barry, a deeply attractive and charismatic figure, <laughs> is just about to enter the mortgage corporation offices in search of a mortgage. <laughs> Can you imagine a company that offers you a mortgage with no frills and no fuss? Just a mortgage that's designed specifically to suit your needs. Well, after that quite brilliant opening scene, <laughs> the film 
for me at least barely puts a foot wrong. The script is littered with witty and wry lines from Mr Norman, the lighting superb and the direction quite outstanding. But the star for me, and indeed for everyone else, must undoubtedly be the astonishingly versatile Mr Norman. <laughs> Turning in as brilliant and polished a debut performance as I for one can ever remember. As in this clip where the highly enjoyable Mr Norman discovers in a dramatic plot twist that mortgages come first at the Mortgage Corporation. <laughs> So, there you have it. The Mortgage Corporation know about mortgages, because at the Mortgage Corporation, mortgages come first. <laughs> Lovely pathos there in the performance by Mr Norman. Clearly relishing every word in a very fruity screenplay that gives full rein to his undoubted talent. If I do have a complaint at all about the film, it's that at 23 seconds it's a trifle short by normal standards. <laughs> One and indeed personally would like to have seen much more of the immensely talented Mr Norman. <laughs> Having said that though, I should add, and probably did, that what we lose on quantity we soon make up for in quality as Mr Norman shows off his astonishingly rich repertoire. <laughs> so there, in effect, you have it. Barry Norman in the Mortgage Corporation advert. And why not? Or indeed, in a sense, why? <laughs> You want to join the army? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm very keen, sir. Excellent, excellent. Well, you won't regret it. We have a tremendous range of opportunities for a young man like yourself in the army. We've got foreign travel, skiing, archery, <laughs> synchronised gang rape, <laughs> Nouvelle cuisine. Anything there which appeals particularly? Well, I want to fight, sir. How do you mean fight, exactly? <laughs> I want to I fight the enemy, sir. Yes, well, we're a bit short of enemies at the moment. <laughs> um, there's mountaineering, water sports. No, it's very kind of you, sir, but just point me at the enemy, sir, and let me kill him, sir. <laughs> yes, thank you, Perkins. You've chosen rather a bad time. Enemies are a bit thin on the ground at the moment. <laughs> Why, this time last year, we've got any number of enemies you could have turned you loose on. Poles, Czechs, Hungarians, East Germans. Oh, yeah, East Germans, sir. I hate them cracks. I hate them, sir. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> sorry, Perkins, you're a little too late. A year ago, you were going to put the boot in and God bless you. They were absolute <laughs> bastards last <laughs> year. The East Germans, cunning, ruthless communists. This year, they're decent, freedom-loving Democrats. It's <laughs> damned awkward. <laughs> so, uh, so I can't fight them, then, sir. No, well, I'm afraid not, Perkins. In the meantime, you've got scuba diving, <laughs> work processing. No, oh, yeah. What about the Russians, sir? I never found a Rusky. Now, we're still fighting them, aren't we, sir? Well, they're again, Perkins, very a difficulty. I mean, as far as we're concerned, the Russians are the enemy. Of course they are. Implacable, deadly enemy. But as far as they're concerned, they're not. It makes things very tricky for us, you see. <laughs> there it is. It takes two to tango. Which reminds me, ballroom dancing? <laughs> Ah, I told you, sir, I want to fight. I want to get a rusky. I want to stick my bayonet in his stomach and rip it open. And I want to, I want to pull out his liver and eat it. <laughs> God, Perkins, if only there were more like you. <laughs> you know, the British Army doesn't like to disappoint chaps as keen as you. You really want to fight the Russians? Oh, yes, sir, yes. Right. Well, we can offer you this two-week package holiday in the Baltic. <laughs> flight, hotel, half board. While you're there, you can volunteer for the Lithuanian Defence Force. <laughs> Oh, is that all there is, sir? Yes, I'm afraid so, Perkins. There is only one problem, that while you're there, you may be conscripted into the Russian army, and then you would have to fight the Lithuanians, in which case there'd be a surcharge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's all too complicated for me, sir. Yes, well, I should imagine practically anything's too complicated for you, Perkins. <laughs> but that's all I can offer you, my friend. Well, I don't see much point in joining the army if you can't slaughter the enemy. Neither can I, Perkins, but then I'm just a simple soldier. The best we can do is to teach you polo and then hang on in the hope that one day, Perkins, one day, the world will be a saner place. <laughs> or there'll be another miners' strike. <laughs> Sally, spring like the in the south, thanks to this band of high pressure just trailing away there. There it goes. So, so still some bright patches over the next 24 hours. <laughs> but as you up in Scotland, spreading to most parts at some time or other. Pulling ahead and then falling and becoming increasingly unsettled, low pressure moving in over. A more detailed picture then, the weather pattern dominated at the moment by a ridge of high pressure out of the Atlantic. There it is, the moment she brings out sometime. 
going back to the chart, we can see they move the end from the unsettled condition. So, so much the same, in fact, as last Thursday. Scattered child, even snow in some of the more exposed places, particularly in the north and the west. Really, most places not be as good with less than that. As the cloud thickens, by the way. Temperatures then, rather than the worst of the time of year, 6 degrees centigrade, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, falling to near freezing overnight up in the north, with the highest temperature in the south, degrees Fahrenheit. All of a pretty cold weekend prospect. So, to sum up then, with tomorrow's picture. That's it. A very good night, dude. <laughs>
<laughs> Hi. Hey, don't peek, it's Des. Hey, tell you what, let's get pally, shall we? What say we skin a tin? Hey, <laughs> must tell, bit of an old stir at the Commonwealth Games. Sebastian Coe, remember him? <laughs> Finished sixth and lost his deposit. <laughs> Tough titty, Sebby. Uh, <laughs> On the upside, though, uh, he passed a dope test, which qualifies him as Conservative candidate for Falmouth. <laughs> Next up, though, spot a snooker. Live action from the World Championship semi-finals. A welterweight contest, this. Over ten rounds between Hurricane Higgins and reality. Uh, a bit of a dream about this. Higgins, of course, goes on to meet Viv Richards in the final. With the details, though, here's Richie Benno, our man with the overnight score. Get my drift. What do you know, Rich? Yes, well, thanks, Des. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And my goodness me, just look at all that protective gear they're wearing out there. Helmet, visors, chest pad, jolly box. And that's just the commentators. Uh. Oh, yes, it's rather nice. Thank you, uh, Bernard. This is a really rather jolly day. Uh, and coming in now is Viv Richards, a short, punchy run-up. Uh, strong attacking action. Uh, right arm over the journalist. Uh, <laughs> Shortly, we'll join Christopher Martin Jenkins for the brawl by brawl commentary uh, with legal advice between the overs from the Old Bailey. Uh, Trevor. Well, well uh, he'll be playing his usual defensive field. <laughs> Two slips and a Queen's Council with a silly point. Uh, but with, 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 with a, with a defence like that, he is going to get caught. Back live now. Hey, looks like a bit of a race to get out of the old communist block. Over to you, Murray Walker. <laughs> In the pits is Stuart Hall. <laughs> and Burr, welcome to Europe's sole frontier. And, it's... <laughs> and they're falling over themselves to elect a government. <laughs> it's lucky little Poland now. Jaruzelski's nominated, so they're playing the Joker. <laughs> There they go, there goes Hungary, there goes Romania, and Czechoslovakia is in the pits dismantling the party machine while the mechanics are out queuing for turtle wax. And this is incredible. East Germany, a new Eastern European record, 45 revolutions a minute. The crowd's gone wild, James Hunt's gone home, we're all going mad, and I'm in the lead. Open out of the works, McLaren. Well, it really is a corker of a game here. We've seen at Murrayfield Gladbach Stadium this afternoon, and it's right. Riot to revolution along, out the way to reunification, back to rearmament, and in the scrum, it's a penalty. Gorbachev there using spoiling tactics around the Baltic, and he's penalised now for not releasing, not releasing Lithuania. And the Lithuanian skipper takes a shot, it's a long way out, you'll need a kick like an Iraqi pipeline, I tell you. But if he succeeds, Desmond, I say they'll be dancing in the streets of Vilnius tonight, and that's a fact. Thank you.